involved in a great struggle. Your generation, you are involved in a great struggle. And if you do not learn to be free, you are going to end up being a slave. This generation has one of the greatest challenges presented to it of any generation in human memory. And that is to stand up for individual rights as an individual at a time when the government and the corporations and business seek to enslave you. In my lifetime, the abolition, the erasure, the abdication of individual rights has been increasingly put upon you. I do not have the same rights as my father. You will not have the same rights and your children will not have the same rights as you. What's going on here? How is that happening? I've run for governor twice in the state of Kentucky, and this is how I started out. I say, you know, I'm about to talk to you about how to politically change this thing around. And I, but if I just had 30 seconds to get your vote about what this is all about, I have one question to ask you. If you answer this question in one way, I've got your vote, no matter what else you think about me. If you answer the question the other way, I don't think you understand the question. And here it is. Did my father's generation hit the beaches of Normandy and Iwo Jima so that I'd have to piss in a cup to hold a job in America? Why, hell no. All Hitler wanted was a new world order. All he wanted was a global economy. And all we had to do was pee in his cup. And we sent a million people halfway around the world to kill that son of a bitch. I can't believe it. You know, I found out that Hitler is the last person that you can call a son of a bitch and be politically correct. You can't hardly call somebody a son of a bitch anymore and be politically correct. Do I understand that you all agree with me that Hitler and all the other urine-testing son of a bitch Nazis ought to be put out of commission? If you're not, you can meet me backstage after this little speech. The fact is that the relationship of government to the people in my lifetime has changed. It has changed from where the government did not have the right to intrude in your private spheres of decision making, into your private behavior, unless you gave them probable cause to do so by do, acting in a suspicious manner or acting in a manifestly criminal manner. It used to be the government could only come into your life and, and, and collect evidence against you and stop you walking down the street if you gave them probable cause to do it. But that has now been changed from probable cause to mandatory random. Now, when you walk down the street, the government can tell you to do anything, and when you ask why, they say, because we have the power to tell you to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's fascism. When they have no system of accountability, when they have no reason to be able to support the way they treat you, that's fascism. Let me give you an illustration. How many people in this group have to piss in a cup to hold a job? There's a lot of you that do because you got to have a paycheck and because you got family. <coughs> and you have to pee in a cup to hold a job. But that is wrong. That is a violation of your civil liberties. That is a violation of your privacy. But they have attached your paycheck to it. When I get to be governor of the state of Kentucky, nobody is going to have to pee in a cup to hold a job in the state of Kentucky. Right. Nobody. The first thing I'm going to do as governor of the state of Kentucky is I'm going to ground every one of those National Guard helicopters in the air. There's not going to be any helicopters hovering over the fields and gardens of the people of the state of Kentucky. This is America, not Afghanistan, and we're not going to treat our people like we're an occupied country. We're going to treat the individual in the state of Kentucky with respect. We're going to cultivate and enlighten and educate and uplift the people not make them slaves of the corporations where they have to prove biological loyalty by peeing in a cup. That is as un-American as it gets, and it's not going to happen in the state of Kentucky. But who is behind...
individuality and individual brilliance is no longer what is sought in this society. They want our children to be the products of a cookie cutter education because our children and you have been thrown into open competition with four billion other people on this planet, many of whom will work all day for a bowl of rice and a mat to sleep on. And GATT and NAFTA has opened up you as an American worker to so-called equality with those people, but you are in a pretty bad pickle because now you don't have any esteem as an American worker. Now you don't have any esteem as an American citizen. This government has just about taken you out from the protections of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution in their push to make it a new world order. <clears throat> I'm against the new world order. I'm against a global economy. If we have to give up the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in order to make us equal with the rest of the world. I'm not a sexist. I'm not a racist, and I'm not xenophobic. I'm a nationalist. I'm a nationalist. I'll eat dinner with the rest of the world, and I'll trade with them, but until they adopt a constitution and a bill of rights that gives their own citizens the rights and privileges we enjoy in our country, they are not our political equal. They are not our political equal. <laughs> we can't give up what makes us special in order to achieve a new world order. Hey, I'm a this government, our government, is no longer in, of, uh, by, and for the people. This government as it exists today is totally bought off by the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial complex. How many here have heard of the Partnership for a Drug-Free America? How about it back there? Have y'all heard of the Partnership for a Drug-Free America? Friday. Yeah. Who are they funded by? Who are they funded by? Do you think that they're funded by families whose children have hurt themselves with marijuana? Hell no. The Partnership for a Drug-Free America, whose stated preamble is to create an attitude of total intolerance for the hemp plant, is totally funded by the Chemical Manufacturers Association. The very same people who make Prozac, who make those little back pills, the very same people who were trying to pharmaceutically lobotomize and enslave our older generation and increasingly our younger generation with Prozac and Ritalin. These people are fascists. You show me somebody who says they want a drug-free society and I will show you an alien. There has never been a drug-free society. There will never be a drug-free society. They know that, but they don't want the farmer competing with them in the production of the safest drug for a drug-free society, that wonderful herb cannabis, which should be totally accessible to anybody over 18 in this society who wants it. You know, this all didn't happen by chance. 150 years ago, we didn't have these problems. 150 years ago, we had nuclear families where the divorce rate is nowhere near what it is today. You could be born on a farm and depend on your mom and dad leaving that farm to you, and you could leave it to your children, and you had roots in a society. And you could be born in a small town and grow up and fall in love and raise a family and live and die because a small town economy would support you. And in the big cities, we didn't have people thrown off the land and out of the small towns to compete for scarce urban resources. And we didn't have the environmental problems that we have today. That's because 125 years ago, the farmer raised all the fiber, all the medicine, all the fuel and all the food that this society consumes. That's what farming is, a natural heritage. And there is a great morality attached to farming. Things like if you don't work, you don't eat. Right. You reap what you sow. Right. There is a time for slaughter, but it's to keep mankind and, and the animal life alive. They cultivate plants. You have a relationship with Mother Earth. There's a basic tenets of society that we learn from our relationship with the natural cycle. But today, the farmer doesn't raise any fiber. If you do, if they do, it's cotton, which accounts for 50% of the pesticides and herbicides used in the agricultural sector. The farmer doesn't raise any medicine. It's all been monopolized by the pharmaceutical companies. The farmer doesn't raise any fuel. It's all been monopolized by the petrochemical companies. And if you go into a grocery store and look at the ingredients on a package, you will find out how rapidly the farmer's being displaced in their heritage of food production. 
It's all been taken over by the synthetic manufacturers who in producing their synthetic products create the toxic waste and the hazardous byproducts with which we have such a tough time dealing. And that was that didn't come about because of consumer demand or supply and demand of the marketplace. It came about because in 1937 they created the New Deal. And the New Deal legislation was a new deal between business and government that gave them a relationship which up to then had been totally illegal and unconstitutional. But what it did was it stopped the farmer from competing with the synthetic manufacturers from the natural cycle. It criminalized the farmer's competition in growing natural fiber, fuel, medicine, and food. For the first time, our government told us, we can tell you what seed you can plant in the ground and what green natural plant you can consume. Oh, they took that power over from us. <clears throat> well, it's time we took that power back. It's time we renegotiated the New Deal legislation that was a new deal between the business and government. It's time we renegotiated the New Deal and this time, including business and government, we need to put the people, the Bill of Rights, and Mother Earth at the negotiating table so that they can watch out for our interests from that view. We have got to humanize the process again. What has happened in our lifetime is that you as an individual and your worth as an individual is no longer the main reason for this government, nor the functions of this government. This government is bought and sold by the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial complex. They have bought Congress off. They own Congress completely. And, and it's going to come down to we either change this system politically or we change it through the use of the Second Amendment. Now, let's talk about what's worth living and dying for in this lifetime. You know, for all you young folks, when I asked, uh, in that last governor's race, when I asked the people, did my father's generation hit the beaches of Normandy and Iwo Jima so I had to fist the cup to hold a job in America, all the 60 and 70 year olds nodded their heads and said, Galbraith, you're absolutely right. And the 20 and the 30 year olds looked up and said, what does he mean by that? What, what does that question mean? <clears throat> well, it means that our fathers had dropped in their lap a question of what is worth fighting and dying for when they were faced with the Second World War. And my generation had the question dropped in my lap of what is worth fighting and dying for in this lifetime when I had to face the Vietnam War. But for you people who have been lucky enough not to have had the question dropped in your lap what is worth fighting and dying for because you had to, had to face a war in your generation, you still must answer that question in order to give passion to your own life. You still must figure out what makes this life worthwhile is you discovering what is worth fighting and dying for on your own terms and on your own grounds. And may I suggest to you, may I suggest to you that you look at the preservation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights because it is, whether you understand it or not, the greatest single protection for you exercising any liberties in this lifetime that there is existent here today. I have... Do it. But you know, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights lives only when you exercise it. Otherwise, it's just a slip of paper. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I have to defend people all the time that have been picked on and shat on by the system. So let me tell you, I've started my own Just Say No campaign, and it's called No Officer, You Can't Search the Goddamn Car. Just Say No Officer, You Can't Search the Goddamn Car. Now, in the state of Kentucky, where sodomy is legal, you can add the question, No Officer, You Can't Search My Car, But Would You Kiss My Ass? Which is a legal question. And you can work it out after you come out of the hospital, but it is a legal question. Fact is, folks, that you have got to stand for your rights. You'd be surprised when you start citing your rights, how you start taking on mantles of protection. And you are the one that gives life to the Constitution. You know, there's a lot of us sitting around and said, you know, if the first thousand Jews 
had taken an SS man with them when they came through the front door, it would never have reached six million. And we got to thinking about, yeah, that's cool, but when they come through your front door, those other 999 people are not standing beside you. It's you who has to make that decision. Is this where I draw the line and fight and die when people come through my door to haul me off and hold me in a cage? And is that worth fighting and dying for? It may not be for you in this lifetime. But our forefathers fought and died for it, and not having to do those kinds of things is what gave birth to the United States and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And there's been so much sacrifice and blood spent and sacrifice for us that we're not even aware of that I just hate to see our generation give it away without a fight. I do not think we should give it away without a fight. I think we should fight these son bitches in the streets. I think we should fight them in the courtrooms. And I think we should fight them at the polls. You have got to get political. You have got to get political. George Bush can only cast one vote. You can cast one vote. Your vote counts just as much. You have got to get political. John Kennedy won president of the United States with an average of less than one vote per precinct. Less than one vote average per precinct that John Kennedy won presidency of the United States. You have got to get political. Because if you don't get political, then I'm going to die in the streets. You have got to get political. Because if you don't get political, I'm going to die in the streets. Because if you don't get political, I'm going to fail politically, and that only leaves one other place to try it, and that's in the streets. Don't fail me politically. Don't fail your children politically. Get involved. Get somebody to run for a local office who will stand up and tell it like it is. Non-illegitimate carborundum. Don't let the bastards grind you down. Thanks very much for your time. Gaywood Galbraith, ladies and gentlemen. God bless this man right here. And uh, if we had uh, one person like this man in each state, what would this country be doing? I'm about to introduce to you all one of the real, true heroes of this generation. You know, back in the early 1980s, after Ronald Reagan had taken over the White House and his, uh, his buddies who wanted to uh, start private prisons and put people in jail for smoking marijuana and forfeit their property, things looked really bad for the individual rights and human rights movement in this country. Things looked really bad for the person against the large corporations. The large corporations were seeking to enslave us all and the political landscape and the individual rights landscape in the United States was very bleak. And, but out there on that horizon, there was a noise and there was a caravan of people who were breaking up that bleak and barren landscape with a caravan called the Cannabis Action Network. And the Cannabis Action Network was a group of young people who went all over the country telling people about hemp and marijuana. And they were funded by a man out of California named Jack Hare. Jack Hare, who had written a book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And if, in fact, as Thomas Edison said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, then Jack Hare is indeed a genius of this generation because you would not be where you're sitting right now if it was not for the next speaker you're going to hear, Jack Hare. There would be no hemp movement if it was not for Jack Hare. Jack Hare has spent millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of hours of his own time investigating and discovering and researching the hemp plant and what it has meant to this planet and to past generations and this generation. Jack Hare is the reason that the marijuana movement has gone where it is today. He's the reason that the people of California had a basis for passing Proposition 215. He's the reason that I am still alive in the hemp movement and the marijuana movement. 
and he is the reason why we are allowed to have festivals like this with people coming out and communing with Mother Nature and paying homage to free speech, the Bill of Rights, their individual human nature, and to that most marvelous of God's gift, cannabis, hemp, ganja, ma, marijuana, the kind weed, the herb, the, the good smoke, and the reason that we're here today. So I want to tell you, in all my searching for the real heroes of this generation, the two heroes that I've come across that qualify for two American heroes in this generation as far as I'm concerned, one of them is my good friend Willie Nelson, and the other is the man I want to introduce and bring up to you right now. Ladies and gentlemen, a real true giant of this generation in your lifetime, you're going to have the pleasure of hearing, and I want you to pay real good applause to this next man, Mr. Jack Hare. Let's hear it for Jack Hare, the father of the modern day hip movement in the United States of America. <laughs> Gate was the real father. <laughs> when we met in the 70s, we first discovered that except for him and I and a couple other people, nobody knew that you could do anything with marijuana except get stoned. Here in the East, I've run into people over and over again that tell me that they can't smoke a joint with me. Hold up. that they can't smoke a joint with me because they're on some form of probation. That they, if they go to smoke today while they're here partying, for instance, they'll be caught on their probation or on their job. Anyway, here in Michigan, people are taking piss tests, lots of people, and it's got to be come to an end. There is only one way to end political misrule. When the government, when a government stops us from a plant like cannabis and says tobacco and alcohol are for sale, the government is totally upside down for cut and you can do anything you want with it, but you can't be quiet because it gives them the idea that they're right. Somehow you've got to stand up. And for those of you who can't stand up because of job, because of family, because of some special circumstance, then give of your income a portion to people, like the people putting on this event here, to the California normal, to the Michigan normal, to the Ohio normal, to the hemp organizations, to organizations that are doing it. They need your support. If you can't stand up and you're going to school, if you can't stand up and you want to, there's another way all of us can stand up. Vote with a dollar bill. Give it, support it. I've never asked you guys for money. I'm not asking you guys for money. But there are organizations all over Michigan, all over Ohio and Indiana that need your support and they can't get it. If you say, I can't go out and collect signatures or do something, go and give money. The government of the United States is not a buddy. Right now, more people are being put in jail for marijuana than any other crime. The government of the United States is cracking down more on marijuana than on anything else. We have jumped 200,000 arrests in two years from 400 and some thousand to 600 and some thousand for marijuana. The safest therapeutically active substance known to man. One thing on earth that nobody has ever died from in the history of this planet, nobody has ever died from marijuana that wasn't shot by a cop. The number one paper source on earth, the number one fiber source on earth, 
the softest, warmest, longest lasting natural cloth made without pesticides, without herbicides, no other plant can compete. And it's illegal to grow in this country when it was the first big cash crop and, had, and people like George Washington, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson used it, grew it, made America move in, in both literature, in sailing, in clothes, in diapers, in towels, in bed sheets. The number one thing was marijuana. And the reason we're not upset about it is we're too nice to people to be upset about it. But if somebody lied to you about anything else, as much as history, you'd get in their face and you got to get up and get in people's face. You've got to write to the editors of the newspapers. You've got to write and say it over and over again. Make sure your documentation is correct and hammer it home. But you don't do it just once, you do it over and over and over and over and over and over again because that's the only way you're going to win. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to be piss tested to your 70s. Yeah. Or living a lie with alcohol killing you and you're having to suggest it to your kid that you have to do alcohol instead of pop. We started the California Marijuana Initiative to teach people and hopefully put it on the ballot. What we want is complete relegalization and the initiative that I support, and I worked for Dennis's Medical Marijuana last year in Los Angeles and I was, and my group was probably the number one volunteer organization in Southern California. We worked for Dennis's initiative and it passed. A lot of Mexicans didn't believe in California that that even if we won 70% of the vote, that the government would ever admit to us having won that. And we were worried. Jesus Christ, none of, no Mexican that I talked to, and we talked to a lot of them that are a part of our organization, believed that the government would let us win on this medical marijuana. That the vote came in and we had 56% gave them faith. They're getting active now. We have more kids willing to be active in marijuana in, in, from the Mexican community than ever before. The only way we can win this is to stand up and teach the information. Get to know the information. Don't read, uh, oh, hemp can make paper fiber fuel. Learn it. Learn it completely. Learn it thoroughly. Learn it from every source, on, from medicine, from paper fiber fuel. Find out it's the number one source on earth. It's greater than all the other sources for paper and fiber and fuel on earth put together. One, it's one of three and a half million plants on earth and it's greater than the other three and a half million of them combined by many, many, many times. And we're staying silent about it when nobody can beat us in argument. You haven't heard me or Chris Conrad or Gatewood Galbraith put down one second about this information about hemp. We've never had to say we're sorry to the government. What we say is, and hemp is the number one source, and what they say is, um, I don't know about, I'm talking about marijuana and the dangers to children, they say. That's all they can do is get you to change the subject. Go out and fight for pot. Tomorrow we'll cover something else. Go out and learn pot, read pot, know pot, and teach it to everybody around you. God bless you. Have fun tonight. I'm here with you. Bye. Jack here, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and a privilege to have him here at the Rainbow Farm. Next, we're going to have Elvie Masika. She is one of eight people in the United States who currently receives federal marijuana. Let's put your hands together and give her a nice hemp aid welcome. One day I was at home thinking, dear God, you know, I'm a legal recipient. It took 12 years. I lost one eye because my doctors have, did not have the freedom and still do not in the United States have the freedom to discuss 
God's work, honestly with me, they can only endorse the pharmaceuticals who set the rules and the perimeters. And unfortunately, they're not going to spend millions of dollars making sure that you know that the research is done, that okay, it's an herb that God said you could grow in the backyard. They want you to deal with little pills. My doctors were cooperative as far as they could go, and as soon as the Marinol came out, I was given it. Doctor probably could have gotten in trouble with, with that one too because it was not recommended for glaucoma. But he knew I was using marijuana illegally and we both hoped that it would work because then we had at least a Schedule two drug to deal with. Isn't that interesting? Marijuana supposedly, according to the scheduling, which is a total lie, has no medical value whatsoever. But the imitation of the one ingredient that gets us mellow and, you know, a little euphoric, the imitation of God's work, now that's the medicine, and it's a schedule too. Hello? <laughs> as, the, as the song said, is anybody here, right? But those things, you know, have been going on and on, and I just wanted to help some more, and I did say a little prayer, and I said, you know, most infinite spirit of love, which is the one God I will always worship, because that is the God that joins me to you. That's that infinite light we each hold within and keeps us together and keeps us going from one generation to the other, hoping to leave a better spot than the one we lived in. That's love. That's what joins us. Anyway, when I was thinking about those things, I thought, well, would you give me the strength and the knowledge so that I can help others to learn? I don't want to contribute to a war on draw to the war thing, and, and people are getting killed on both sides, and I don't want any blood on my hands, but I want to help the people who need it, you know. Boy, be careful what you pray for. Within 20 minutes, I got my first call for the University of Florida, and I have been on the road ever since. Because it was there that I began to learn these different things that you have heard so eloquently discussed tonight. And after I got on the road with the Cannabis Action Network, which was mentioned here earlier, a, a, a young group of people who travel in you, some old bands, we went everywhere. I remember being in North Carolina thinking, anyone wants to get rid of us, we will never be missed off of one of these cliffs, that's it. But instantly knowing, knowing, it wasn't a voice that spoke to me, it was a knowledge that we were being protected by freedom spirits that have gone beyond, that were glad to give their lives to make sure this freedom was preserved for all of us. And I saw that spirit and I felt it all over this country. I felt it here in Michigan when I, when I won my Freedom Fighter of the Year award. I felt it when we traveled through New England. In fact, in New England was where I was inspired to write that last song that I just sang to you um, because I was seeing the signs on the roof, you know, that said, get a real job. So it's been quite an experience and one that's really brought me to you, but the sad part of it is that I never had to lose any sight. That as soon as I was diagnosed with glaucoma, a kind doctor told me that if I didn't start smoking marijuana, I was going to go blind. And I thought he was crazy because I didn't want to go on drugs. I was, you know, doing at least a pack of cigarettes every day and having a drink here and there, no doubt, I still do. But I didn't think those were drugs. So I was terrified of the medicine that would have indeed kept the sight in my better eye as it has maintained it on my left eye. I did use the marijuana, it did work, but those poor doctors were not free to tell me the truth. So they had to advise me to take surgeries that would lead me literally to a blind alley where I was when I was arrested. I had lost my eye completely. So we went to, to war, so to speak, or joined the war as victims, as casualties, were pushed into those situations. And um, learning more about it, learning, for instance, that there were at the time 300,000 people being arrested yearly for, medical mar for marijuana, period really broke my heart. I didn't have any idea how serious the problem was. Now it has doubled. We're arresting nearly 600,000 people. The time has come for people to understand their responsibilities, to talk to their conscience, to understand what it is that we're fighting for. And I'd like... It's amazing, you know, what a group of people can do. The power to change this day to a new one. We have begun 
a journey that will open doors we haven't even dreamed of. In California, in Arizona, there were people who were teaching. It's like Jack Hare was out there, Chris was out there, everybody was out there for years, pounding away, teaching people, having seminars. That Venice Beach booth, that's something else, historical landmark, no doubt. Where more people learn about hemp on a daily basis and see the products. And this kind of attitude of people who have invested, all of you who are out here making your necklaces and your clothing and bringing it out here to share with each other so that we can show it out to the rest of the world. Your job has been so superb that you have started with a one million dollar industry which now is 200 million. That's growth, in spite of the difficulties you have had to deal with. And as more and more of us come out of that closet, just as the gays had to do to earn their rightful place in society once more, we too need to come out of our closets. Well, I'm talking to the ones that are out, so that's kind of a waste of time. But we need to pass the message. The message is that there are people, very powerful corporations, there are people, you have to pay attention, for instance, to the, the, the things you use in your life. And if you find out that those are contributors to the war on us, because that's what we're having here, then you need to boycott because the pocketbook is where it really, really hurts. You have to understand that Anheuser Bush says you should have a Bud Weiser, but they won't let you have a Weiser Bud. <laughs> they buy the helicopters for the news so that they can spy on you and report to the police who by law cannot fly and spy on you that law. These people are not doing their job in tune with nature and you need to remind them that if you're going to continue to support that industry, um, they need to understand that there is a wiser God as well that you would maybe like to have in your life as a choice. It is sad to think of the the people that will die on the highway just this holiday alone as a result of abuse of alcohol, many, very often, the homicides and the violence that will take place, the rapes that go on in our colleges, while our children cannot attend a simple concert or a sports event that's not sponsored by alcohol companies. Come on, there's no war on drugs here. We need to wake up. Exciting things are happening. With California and Arizona bringing in that new day through those elections, and that's right, Arizona just got turned down. People have denied their right to their freedom through the elections, stating clearly that we no longer have a democracy in that particular state, at least for sure. But I think it's all over. But it's opening people's eyes. Just, when, just like when McCarthy and the, well, the Czar, McCarthy and Janet Reno stood there on December 29 and told the American public that they were not changing the laws, that they would continue to persecute and prosecute doctors who dare to speak about medical marijuana, that they would remove their licenses, that they would imprison the doctors, and that they would interfere with any kind of funding that they could possibly get in any way that the government related to it, such as Medicare programs, or Medicare, or Medicaid, whatever. Hey, I was so glad that at last the rest of the world got to hear exactly what we as patients have been dealing with for over 20 years. Now, I am seeing people since that election. That election was the dawn of a new day. The dark night of ignorance is over because once the day begins, you have to go through it. The sun will get brighter and brighter till we can all see. And it is all of us. And we need to understand that because for every action, there is a reaction. And we need to te teach that to our children from the time they begin to walk which we do, you know, we show them that if they insist on banging their head on the table, it's going to hurt, you know, and things like that. But we need to, to show them responsibility for themselves, for each other, for our community, for the planet. And the only way we can show them is by example. We need to get out there. 
Now, people all over the country are doing what you already did in Michigan once, but people are catching on to it, and it's going to be an extremely powerful tool in continuing the path that Arizona and California has fell out for us. That is, we're gathering patients throughout the country, and in several states there will be marches. Ohio is imperative, and Kay Lee is working there with a woman named Joan Ballow, who has written a tremendous book about the effects of the psychological, physical, and spiritual benefits of marijuana. And she has a list of patients, and she's someone that needs to be contacted if you know a patient that wants to participate. These patients are going to go and meet with legislators. These patients are going to parade and put faces and names in the news of their lives and how these laws are affecting them. These are very, very beautiful, brave people who deserve your respect and your cooperation and your love and your prayers. These are your brothers and sisters that I'm so proud, as I am proud of all of you. Yes. Okay, I think we know one thing, that each and every one of you is needed in this movement. We may not have the numbers out there yet, but each of us has at least one, if not more, special talents that will enable us to enlighten those people so that they can make rational decisions. For every action, as I said before, there's a reaction. There's been too much negativity in the past. We know that we cannot adopt, adopt their methods because we will surely lose. They certainly have more arms and more money than we do. So, and their way has not pre proven effective anyway. But we have tools, tools that they can never buy with all their millions, tools that we carry with us from the very beginning and we will take with us until we change these laws. They are called truth. And just like my CD is entitled, Truth and Love Really Are One. Truth and Love Are One. And so I really foresee a day in which we will all rejoice as we watch the suffering come to an abrupt ending, just as the Berlin Wall went down, just as the Iron Curtain went down, just as California in medical marijuana in and today they are smoking there and they are growing there and they find refuge and company in their buyers clubs and God bless all of you who have helped in any way and even with your thoughts because every good thought is a prayer and don't you forget it. I know that if we base our decisions on that love and just continue to tell the truth through our artwork, through our stories, through the internet. Computer skills. You people are perhaps the most talented segment of society from what I've been able to observe. Your, talent is, your talents have no end, no limits. The sky is your pie. L.V. Masika, let's, let's give her a big hemp aid round of applause. Right now, one of the brilliant men on this hemp tour, Mr. Chris Conrad. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And uh, to the guys from Three Rivers that were asking for directions earlier today, I hope you made it. We're here in an era that has been built upon the concept of alienation and disempowerment. And yet, Today we bring a message of empowerment and future prosperity for everyone here. This whole system which has pulled people away from their real connection to the planet and misled us about our own lives. I went to college and when I went to the seminary and I went to schools and educated myself very carefully and I graduated with a magna cum laude degree, and I never learned anything about hemp. When Jack was talking about that yesterday, Jack Hare, it reminded me again how upsetting it is to know that the educational system is in fact complicit in hiding the truth from the American people. But the truth is inherent 
and the experience of life itself carries with it the pleasures of not learning of learning and of knowledge and the educational system seems to be designed to kill that pleasure in people's lives but it's a pleasure that can easily be regained it's a pleasure that comes from planting the hemp seed in the ground and watching what a little moisture and a little seed and a little soil and a little fertilizer means what it means to watch that flower the plant begin to sprout and to grow and it needs your attention and it needs your nourishment and it counts upon you and you nurture and you guide that plant and you let it grow and as you watch it grow you see one set of leaves after another unfolding opening up the plant spreading out growing and as it matures the fiber strengthens and the strong becomes strong and it holds its head high in pride and the plant grows and it flowers and the flowers produce those wonderful cannabinoids including THC tetrahydrocannabinoid on the trichomes of the resin glands of the flowers of the cannabis plant that connects with the receptors in the human brain and it reminds us why we are here why indeed do we take the risks that we do to stand firm in the name of freedom and justice and it reminds us that this planet can heal and it can grow back and once you've seen the inherent logic of the natural order of regrowth and rejuvenation, it can never be taken from you. And it's important that we go forth from here determined that we shall grow hemp in Michigan. I said yesterday that the experience of fighting the drug war is like wrestling an elephant that as you knock it down, you're in danger it might fall upon you and it can still get up and be an elephant. And I see here today that we are standing with our brothers and sisters in the militia who are here to protect us and to keep our rights free. I must say though, that the cannabis reform movement is at its core a pacifist movement, a movement that is not based upon the idea that we need violence to win, in fact, we shall build as Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Jesus Christ and all those who have gone before in the name of peace and we will build a peaceful future. And so I thank these militia for being here to protect this very vulnerable cadre of people who are ready to protect the future and make the world better for everyone else. So thank you for protecting the ceiling of hope and for helping us to grow a new hemp order for the future of man and humanity itself. I know this can be done. In my opening remarks, I said that this event itself is like an allegory of what we experience in the hemp movement. And sure enough, I've seen that allegory unfold once again. We've come together in the days of sun and of music to enjoy the experience of getting high together. And let me say this, that this is a point of pride. We do not stand here in embarrassment and shame, hiding the fact that we are cannabis smokers and adults who know how to take a responsible enjoyment of our lives. We are indeed proud and we demand the respect that belongs to us and we are not hanging our heads, we are holding our shins up. And so we came together and the rain came behind us, the rain that helps the hemp plants grow. And when the rain hit, we all pitched in together and we enjoyed that rain and we held and took care of one another in that rain and we created a community on hope and even as the rain was coming down and beating upon us and it was getting cold more reinforcements came in and they continued to come in to enjoy this sacred moment of being in a society that freely enjoys this God-given a natural arising herb and so, now the weather changes, the nights grow long, it's getting dark and a little chilly again, and still a solid core of people have hung together.
bonded together, working together with a shared experience of this moment. And we've had dependable workers spreading out the straw and helping to make our lives more comfortable and solving the problems that have arisen. When individuals have had problems, there have been people here to help us. That is indeed the spirit that cannabis has shown us. People working together for the good of all. And so I cannot accept that this human species, which for 10,000 years has planted countless fields of hemp and worked together to build the food, clothing, paper, housing, shelter, plastics, energy, and the needs of society and providing medicine for all, and grown that hemp and tilled the field and harvested and processed the crop and brought it to society in the form of goods that have advanced all of our lives. I do not believe that we have done this just so that this generation shall be sacrificed upon the altar of the petrochemical industry. No, we've done too much. We've grown too much hemp. We've built too many civilizations. The work of Jack Herrer, myself, Gatewood Galbraith, Elvie, and all the other great speakers who've been here today, we've done too much to let it slide away from us. The work of Max and Tom, Moses, Raleigh, Woboy, Derek, and everybody backstage who made this show happen, that work is not in vain. That work is the foundation for a better future. And all the bands and the militia, the bands to keep us entertained, the militia to keep the peace, we are working together. We are bringing together the farmers, the environmentalists, the legislators, the activists, the community, the young people, the old people alike, the sick, the doctors, the physicians. What we need is for the leaders to see the power that we hold together. And so we send a message, as indeed Proposition 215 sent a message from California when 56% of the voters came out and supported medical marijuana. But that was not enough. And we sent a message when Arizona passed its initiative by 65%, only to be seen as it made into a democracy instead of the democracy, when the politicians attempted to roll that back, but we shall not let them roll that back. And that was not enough either. And when 12 state legislatures have discussed restoring industrial hemp, and four of them have adopted legislation to look at the industrial value of hemp to save our state economies and create jobs and help our young people build a better future. Woo! We've done that and it is not enough. And the reason it's not enough is again because our approaches are based upon misunderstanding that has been willfully inflicted upon us. Because we've all been told that there are three branches of government and they have checks and balances built in. That you've got the executive branch, you've got the congressional branch, the legislative branch, and you've got the judicial branch or the courts. And that those three are supposed to protect us from one another. Well, what then, when they are in fact complicit in committing a crime of genocide and of ecocide and of planetary murder at the expense of the American people, what do we have for our recourse? The answer is we have the American people. Because indeed there are five branches of government, two of which you don't hear about. The fourth branch is the voters who adopt the initiative language and go to the polls and pass good initiatives and throw out the bums who have corrupted our society. The voters are who I'm talking about. And the fifth branch is the juries that stand as guards to prevent the brothers and sisters who live their lives in honest belief 
that this is indeed the land of the free and act accordingly and then they're sent to prison. The people who sit in those juries have a duty to release them, to vote to acquit. They rape our minds, they rape our hearts, but we stand firm. And so with that, I have to tell you that until we get the marijuana prisoners out of prison, this battle shall continue. We've been told that we must either win or perish. And I tell you now, we shall win and flourish. <laughs> and so I ask you again, it's been great partying with you here at Hemp A 97, and the party's not over yet. But most important is what you do next when you leave through the gates into the drug-free zone, which has no other freedoms for you barely except for being drug-free. So go to your communities and educate and plant the seeds, the seeds of knowledge, the seeds of ideas, the seeds of business and commerce, the seeds of new political campaigns, to seize our future and regain control of our natural destiny of freedom, dignity, liberty, and prosperity. Take action, organize, and come see me over at the Hemp Museum. Read my books, Hemp Lifeline of the Future and Hemp for Health. If you've got a copy with you, come over. I'd love to sign it. If you don't have a copy, we just happen to have a few with us. And most importantly, I want to talk to you about what you intend to do and how I can help you. Thank you very much.